Alright, then. Alright, oh, dang it. So, this section is going to reiterate the peripheral nervous system. So, as I already mentioned, it's going to be a lot of stuff that we've heard before, a couple new terms, but we're not learning anything new from scratch. <clears throat> First of all, peripheral, where are we talking about? The limbs, right. We're not central nervous system, which is what the last chapter 12, the whole chapter was central. We're going back to peripheral again because whenever we would discuss peripheral, we looked at this diagram. This is kind of a cutout of, and just kind of highlighting what we're going to look at. So we're going to look at the different divisions now in just a little bit more detail. But I, I feel like you should be kind of comfortable with the terminology. Somatic being what? Voluntary. Autonomic being? Involuntary. Sympathetic. Fast and speeding up. Yes. And parasympathetic is? Slowing down. Um, here, I went back a slide. But it says that when we're talking about the peripheral nervous system, this is the link between your body and the outside world. So we're going to be getting a lot of information, sensory information, from our surroundings. And we're going to see, of course, a lot of sensory uh, receptors, but then we're going to have to react to them. In what direction does sensory information travel? Uh, what's the word we use for that? Afferent or afferent. And then motor information travels efferently down, right? And when we're talking, generally speaking, remember that sensory is going to be in blue, motor is going to be in red. Um, when we're talking about sensory, it's always going to be dorsal. Motor is always going to be ventral. So those patterns are going to stay. So it's not learning anything <coughs> new or crazy that we have not discussed already. This slide right here covers sensation versus perception. And we discussed this in our last lecture. But sensation is that if something's going on and, and you're sensing it but you're not really consciously responding to it. Perception is when you're consciously deciding how to react. And I gave the example of that student calling my name in the hallway and me choosing not to turn around. I was perceiving that. And then there's sensation where you know things are going on. You're just not responding to that. We really hone in on that when we talk about cortex, the cortex. And that's what we were referencing when we initially discussed that. <clears throat> now... For receptors, when, anything that says receptors, we, I need you to be able to already know that that's going to be sensory. So what we're talking about right now are the different types or classifications of sensory receptors. Okay? How can we classify different sensory receptors? The first is by the type of stimulus they detect. So I'm gonna, we'll discuss those first. The second way of classifying them is where they're located. The third way is how complex they are. So I'm going to go through, so this is the intro, and then it's going to divide the next couple slides over these three classifications. So the type of stimulus that they detect. Pretty straightforward, but if you're a mechanoreceptor, you receive information on, like, movement, mechanical distortion, twisting, pressure, something like that. Okay, if you're a thermoreceptor, temperature receptor. I respond to temperature, so it's hot or cold. What about a chemoreceptor? Chemicals, like it's spicy or it's not or it's salty. Okay, so chemoreceptors. Photoreceptors respond to light. Okay, and then nociceptors. Nociceptors is probably new to you. It may not be, but nociceptors are your pain receptors. So nociception is what keeps you alive, so everyone needs pain receptors, and we'll discuss pain tolerance in just a bit. So by their stimulus, this is the classification. Now, if we classify the sensory receptors by their location, <clears throat> the first location is exteroceptors. And just using a logical mindset, where do you think exteroceptors might be located? On the outside, okay? They help you sense things superficially, exteroceptors. So your special senses like sight, taste, stuff like that, exteroceptors. If that's on the outside, what do you think the opposite would be? Okay, on the inside. So we have interoceptors. So also referred to as visceroceptors. And I feel like that name alone tells you where they're located. Okay? And again, these are just general feelings, uh, general sensing. But in interoceptors are found on your viscera. All right? So then proprioceptors. I've mentioned this before. But proprioceptors are found in your skeletal muscle and tendons, and they're the ones that send messages to your brain to tell you where everything is located. So at no, no time are you wondering where your pinky toe is. It's there. And it's reminding you over and over again that it's there. Like, you don't ever forget that. Okay? I mean, 
whatever. You're not going to forget it unless you're like prepared. Now, the classification by their structure. So first we did by the stimulus. So that was like photo, chemo, um, thermo, mechano. That's by their stimulus. Then by their location was extero, intero, and proprio. And now by their structure. General senses versus special senses. Let's discuss this briefly. Special senses are like seeing, hearing, tasting. That's in A and P2. So what we're talking about right now is what we consider general senses. So like pressure, touch, chemicals, all of that type of thing. Okay? So this chapter is not over the eye, the ear. That's actually where we come in on special senses in A and P2. That will be our very first lecture in A and P2. So we're not talking about special senses. We're just referencing general senses. And when we look at their structure, um, there's going to be encapsulated and non-encapsulated. So it's going to get us there. But thermoreceptors. Thermoreceptors are, we already said, going to respond to temperature. And you have this range, homeostatic range, that you can tolerate. So if you get hot, you, do you have receptors that are going to tell you you're hot? Yes. Okay, and then what are you going to do in response to that? You're going to sweat so that you can cool down. And if you're cold... You'll have sensory receptors that tell you that you're cold, and what are you going to do? You're going to shiver. Now, anything outside of your homeostatic range or outside of your tolerance would activate nociceptors, and nociceptors are responsible for what? Pain. So if it's too hot, not only are you getting the message that it's hot, but now it's becoming painful. When Nociceptors are what keep you alive because pain makes you stop, or it's supposed to. That's the goal of it. And when you experience pain, what are you trying to do to it? Stop it. When you get too cold, you activate nociceptors, and it tells you there's impending damage. Your tolerance, and it's not going to say this for a few more slides, but your tolerance is genetically predetermined. We all receive, if, if I put my hand on the stove, and you put your hand on this, we're both receiving the same stimulus. One of us may be able to tolerate it more. Okay, so your, your tolerance for pain varies, and that's an individual thing. We all experience the same. It, it activates the same sensors, but our tolerance varies, and that, that's a lot to do with genetics. Okay, so it talks about how you, have, you, you stay within your homeostatic range or nociceptors are um, activated. And here, it's talking about unencapsulated, and on the previous one, encapsulate. But we're going to, I'm going to show you a diagram before I show you more about that. Here, it's talking about nociceptors in response to capsaicin. Does anybody know what that is? It's not a vitamin. It's, it's peppers. Yes, peppers. And your response to that. So some people can eat hot things and it not be phased, they not be phased by it. Some people can barely taste it and then they're like, ha, ah. okay? And that's, of course, that's painful for them, so that's going to activate nociception. And that also helps keep you alive. So if it's too hot for you, what are you probably going to do? You're, yeah, hopefully you stay away from it. But, I mean, you might just be doing a dare. Anyways, nociceptors respond to any type of, it basically sends a message that something could be potentially be damaged, okay? So here it's getting into the non-encapsulated, I want to show you pictures. Let's talk about the word encapsulated versus non-encapsulated. If it's encapsulated, what do you think it might be surrounded by? A capsule. If it's not encapsulated, there's no capsule. We're talking about nervous tissue, so what color should I be looking for? Yellow. So here I have nerves, and I have yellow tissue there that is not encapsulated. Let me show you what encapsulated looks like so that you can compare. Encapsulated by connective tissue, protecting it. So when it says organization by structure, I kind of wish that these slides would have come first so you could visualize it, but that's what it's referencing. Encapsulated nerve endings that look like this that are protected and non-encapsulated nerve endings that look like this that are not encapsulated, okay? On this also, in both of these chapters, 
I, I have included all the diagrams that were from the textbook that divide everything up. So if, it's, if you're going over the notes and you're looking at the review and you can't find something, you should be able to find it in one of those diagrams as far what the information is that you need to know. Okay. Um, but here, there's, there's giving you that. Let's see. These are going to come up here briefly, but we've actually already studied these. We studied these in the integumentary system because they were pressure receptor, receptors, light touch receptors. So tactile or Merkel's discs and hair follicle receptors. Those are the receptors that are found in each one of your tiny little hairs. When you pull a hair, you know it because every hair has a nerve. So we've discussed these before. We just didn't reference them like this. So again, here's those diagrams. Here are encapsulated nerve endings. So their structure is encapsulated. Tactile, lamellar corpuscles, bulbous corpuscles, muscle spindles, tendon organs, and joint kinesthetic receptors. We're kind of going to reference these today when we talk about stretch receptors. But these are all just general senses. So uh, general senses. So they respond to vibration, pressure, touch. Like it's not anything specific. Okay. What this is referencing here is the structure of it, that it's encapsulated. So then again, you have that, and it tells you where in the body you can find them. Once again, the difference between sensation and perception. I'm not going to discuss it any further. Sensory integration. When you sense something, like if I look at something, is my visual receptor the only part that's responding or receiving information when I look at something? No. I'm receiving information in different forms. I might only be acknowledging the visual information, but there's other forms of information that I'm taking in. So what it's telling you here is that somatosensory, what am I doing right now? Voluntary sensing. Okay, so it, we already discussed what that means, but it receives input from exteroceptors, proprioceptors, and interoceptors. So basically, all types based on location of receptors. So there's never just one. You might be referencing one, like a chemoreceptor or a baroreceptor when you're talking about blood pressure. But a baroreceptor for blood pressure, so baro, a barometer measures pressure, is also an interoceptor. Does that make sense? So even though you're just saying one, it could be classified other ways. So there's more. There's always more. Okay? Um, and we already know that if it's sensory, it's traveling in which direction? Uh, adaptation. There are two ways that you can adapt to things. <clears throat> you can adapt quickly or you can not adapt at all. Adaptation would be one of those examples I was giving you the other day of whenever we're driving in the vehicle and my kids are screaming and hitting each other and I've adapted to that sound. I don't even process it. I know it's going on, but I'm not acknowledging it. Okay? Then there's situations where you cannot adapt at all. You cannot adapt to that stimuli. Like pain. Why do you not want to be able to adapt to pain? You'll die. If you can adapt to high levels of pain, that gives us information that your tissues are damaged, and too much tissue damage will lead to death. So when we talk about adaption or adaptation, however you want to say it, to pain, it depends on what the situation is and whether or not we should have a adaptation, or we should adapt or not. So phasic is one of those ones where you can kind of Zone it out is what I like to call it. Like, you smell something, you smell a smell that you don't like, but after a while, you don't smell it anymore. If you walked out of the room and came back, you would smell it. But at, when you're in that room, you, that smell, you've just adapted to it. If you cut your arm off, you don't want to adapt to that. You want to say, oh, no, this hurts. I need to go get help and get repair. Okay? So tonic receptors do not adapt. And that's mostly nociceptors. Why do we not want proprioceptors to adapt? Do you remember what proprioceptors give us information on? Location, where everything is located on your body. Okay, and it's constantly firing messages. So we don't want pain receptors to adapt, and we don't want uh, proprioceptors to adapt. Okay, because you're, hopefully you're constantly moving. But even if you're not physically moving, stuff is still moving, okay? Perception of pain, I've already discussed this, but it mentions here, either on this slide or the next slide, that this is genetically predetermined. 
to an extent. Um, and sometimes when you're in an extreme amount of pain or something traumatic happens, you block out the pain because of the adrenaline rush. We don't technically use the term adrenaline in these notes. We use epinephrine and norepinephrine, but it's the same type of effect. So when people get experienced traumatic situations, at first they seem to be fine, like they just got in this really crazy wreck, and they're talking to you and they're fine, but as soon as the adrenaline runs off or the epinephrine wears down, they're like smashed. Okay, so it does mention here the fact that sometimes you're too excited to realize that you're hurt. Okay, and we see that in, in traumatic situations. Pain tolerance genes determine that. Your response to medications is also pretty much predetermined. Some of you are very sensitive to medications, some of you are not. This is also why we don't share medications and why whenever you're at school, we send kids to AEP if you let somebody use their inhaler. Like, hey, you have asthma, I have asthma. I didn't bring my inhaler today. We're running at soccer. Can I borrow your inhaler? It's, we can't do that because we might not be using the same form of bronchodilator. And I might be allergic to what she has. And if I have a reaction and it kills me, who's responsible? She is. And so we treat that just like we would drugs because we don't know how people are going to respond to those. So it is kind of weird, and a lot of parents do get upset when you go to AP for letting somebody use your inhaler. But the reality is, is that you don't respond the same way. Another great example is NyQuil. Some people can take NyQuil, and it will knock them out. Some people can take NyQuil, and they'll be up for hours. Okay? So it's, you can't just assume that because that's what that medication is supposed to do, that it does it for everyone because we're all just a little bit different. And you keep that in mind also if you go into pharmaceuticals. Phantom limb pain. So first of all, um, this is talking about the fact that when you have long-lasting pain, like a chronic type pain, if you have a patient that comes in and says, my back's been hurting for months, the goal of that practitioner would be to figure out what's causing that pain. There's a difference in doctors, though. If you tell me your back's been hurting for months and I truly want to help that patient, I'm going to try to figure out what's causing that pain. If I just am going to treat the pain, what am I going to do? I'm going to give them some pills and say, help you feel better. And then when those pills wear, run down, what's going to happen with that patient? They're going to come right back and say, hey, my back is still hurting. So there's a difference in treatment as well. But the goal is, if you do have a patient who has long-term <coughs> chronic pain, that you're teaching them how to cope with that pain, um, helping them work through it. If it's something traumatic that can't be fixed, then I can understand the, the medication and trying to make them feel comfortable. But those are also very addicting, and, and I'm sure you're not naive to any of that. Phantom limb pain is a pain felt by a patient that no longer has a limb. We, we see this in a lot of amputees. Actually, it's pretty common. And the reason why is brought up later in our notes, but our um, sensory information comes back up. Our most, some of, We have some mixed nerves. So we're having the same information travel the same path just because that's the way our nerves are laid out. And so you have somebody who's missing an arm who's talking about their hand cramping. And you're like, you don't have a hand. But no, I have a cramp in my hand. And this, we see this a lot in the VA hospitals or people who, of course, have been amputated on. So what do we do? Initially, we give them epidurals to help kind of numb that out. And then we teach them how to cope with that because, again, you don't want them to be addicted and you want to improve the quality of their life. So phantom limb pain is, is what that is. Referred pain. Referred pain is when they say it hurts here, but there's nothing here that hurts. Referred pain is because, again, we're going to talk about those mixed nerves when we look at the anatomy. It's because they run similar tracks. So, for example, if somebody's having kidney problems, they might talk about the backs of their legs or inner thighs hurting, and it may be anywhere in this lower abdominal area that's pain, they're feeling pain, and it's their kidneys. Okay? When you have a heart attack, where do, where do patients feel that? Their arm. And that's because that nerve runs along. That, so it, it's receiving information along that track. Is it their arm that's cramping? No, it's their heart that's experiencing this trauma. But nonetheless, we call it referred pain. So doctors use this as kind of an indicator. This is kind of a map for referred pain. Okay, if they're talking about right here in their lower right quadrant, and they're talking about some pain here, this it could potentially be their appendix even though their appendix might be over a little bit more. Just started spitting again. Okay, we talked about the heart attack. Lungs and diaphragm up here 
a lot of times patients are like, somebody's like, I feel like an elephant sitting on my chest. And it's, they feel that pain here, and it's down here that's actually hurting, that's actually damaged. So we use that for a reference and a, as to what, what could potentially be hurt, and that's what we call referred pain. I just want to make sure I've covered everything there. Yes. Okay. Structure of a nerve. My favorite part of this is it matches that of a muscle. And we went into a lot of detail on muscle. And so here we have the nerve. Endoneurium, perineurium, and epineurium. You, you've heard those prefixes, those roots before. And the neurium just tells you that it is a nerve tissue, right? So it's the same setup. We have fascicles and the, the myelin sheath for the individual nerves. So this is a nerve up close. And I keep saying nerve because what system am I referring to? The peripheral nervous system. If it was the central nervous system, we would call it a tract. Right. So here you have the epineurium and then you have the individual fascicles that are surrounded by the perineurium and then the individual nerves, the endoneurium. So same setup like we looked for muscles. So that I, I don't feel, is everybody okay with that? Let me say not what I feel. All right, classifications of nerves. You usually have sensory or motor, and we've talked about those, but many of your nerves are also considered mixed nerves. Basically what that means is that the sensory and the motor are right next to one another, and so they're wrapped together. So one doesn't function as sensory and motor, it's just that sensory and motor are right next to each other, so they're wrapped together. And I'm gonna give you some examples here in a little bit. But that's what we mean, it's not one nerve that's sensing information and controlling it. It's two together sensing, and then the other one is going back down, efferent and motor. It's just together. Mixed nerve. Okay? When we look at our classifications of mixed nerves, I feel like you should be able to distinguish the difference here. Somatic afferent. What does that mean? Voluntary, Voluntary sensory. sensory. Exactly. Like, it's... <laughs> Somatic efferent, visceral afferent, involuntary sensory, yes, visceral efferent, yes, you see what I'm saying, we're good. When we looked at uh, the peripheral nerves, I had mentioned this briefly the last time we were together, but there's cranial nerves and spinal nerves, I was like, what's that? I was going to say sacral, but that was wrong. Cranium and spinal. You have 12 pair of cranial nerves, 31 pair of spinal nerves. So, um, in just a few, we're going to just start talking about those individual nerve groups and pulling out just the important aspects so you know generally what that nerve does. What's the term ganglia referencing? A bunch of cell bodies. So we recognize that as being a bulge. So you're going to see that today as well. Um, when we talk about nerve damage, it's going to say here that central nervous system, once the central nervous system is damaged, there's usually not much that you can do. Um, scar tissue replaces it, and you lose the function of that area. But peripheral nerves, there's a lot of research that shows that depending on how severe the damage is, it may be able to repair itself. If, when that net nerve is severed, if they're pretty close to one another, they actually send signals back and forth until they can regenerate and rejoin. This is exactly why when women have tubal ligations or men have vasectomies, that they are naturally reversed. Because when the doctor severed that tube, he left them close to one another. And so they were like, hey, I'm over here, hey, I'm over here. And they send signals and they reattach and regenerate that tissue. So it naturally reversed that surgery. Whenever that started happening and becoming more and more prevalent, now you have a vasectomy or a tubal ligation, and they cut, they burn, they sew, and they separate to make sure that they don't reconnect. But if our nerves are damaged and they're close enough, they'll start to fix themselves. But if they're like this far, they're not going to do that naturally. Okay, so that's what it's going to talk about here. Again, peripheral nervous system is more likely to heal than the central nervous system. So what it's going to go and kind of show you that, that process of regeneration here. 
So here we have some type of trauma has occurred and that nerve has been severed. You can see there's fragments. So then we have to clean up the fragments, get rid of the damaged tissue, and we'll work on regenerating new nervous tissue. So you have your macrophages in there. Cleaning up, then you can see that these individual axons are starting to connect. Then once we wrap all those axons, it'll become a nerve. And that Schwann cell will go around it and insulate it. And we have a regenerated healthy nerve. It's the same process as we saw with the bleeding and the integumentary system. Okay, But the difference is here in the bleeding part, because that's epithelial tissue, it's more likely to regenerate. Here, it's this, this is really determines whether or not it's going to fix itself. Also, um, there's quite a few surgeons. If you have severed a limb or severed a nerve, they have tools and the knowledge to set those nerves up to where you can regain usually motor control. The sensory part, sometimes it's like, uh, you may receive, you may regain sensation, but at least you can control it. So um, the motor part. There's a lot of that happening now too as science <coughs> continues to um, transform or evolve. Right here, this, you don't have to memorize these, so I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on telling you, this is how I would do it because you don't have to memorize them. What this is telling you is it's coming up with an, a mnemonic device or a memory tool that helps remember the 12 cranial nerves. Okay, What you're going to have to be familiar with if they're on your review is what that nerve, it, the nerve name, where it is, if it has sensory or motor function, and what that sensory or motor function is. Okay, Some of them have just sensory, some of them have just motor, and some of them are mixed. But I, it, for you and the cramming that would be necessary for this test, you're just functioning based on what's on the review. Cranial nerves, we have 12 pair, and we say pair because whatever you have on the right side is mirrored on the left because you and I are bilaterally symmetric. So it's not going to go into, oh, well, this one, this one. Each of your nerves, for the most part, is named based on what it does. For example, oculomotor. It's something I what? Mm -hmm. Movement. Okay? So you can kind of figure that out. Abducens. What is abduction? Take away. Take away. So whatever this nerve does, it's going to take it away from the midline. Okay? And you're going to see that. Um, guess what the facial nerve does? Yeah, something with the face. Mm -hmm. Vestibulocochlear. Hearing and balance. Right, and we're going to talk about that. Remember, vestibular is balance. Glossopharyngeal. Tongue and pharynx. Yes, pharynx. <clears throat> so, as we go through that, the vagus nerve, probably you've heard of that. But today, we'll talk about exactly what that is. So, many of these, you can kind of, olfactory, optic, you can kind of figure that out. Here's a tool for study. The nerve, does it have a sensory function? Does it have a motor function? And then right here, it's saying, could it be parasympathetically innervated? Some of your nerves are only sympathetic. That means we want them going all the time. We don't want them to slow down. If they need the ability to slow down for whatever reason, it'll say parasympathetically innervated. So it'll have a yes there. So only a few of those have yeses. All right, so we're just going to go through it, but this should go kind of quickly because you know that the olfactory nerve is probably responsible for doing what? Smelling. Do you think it's sensory or motor? It's sensory, right, because right, you don't motor smell. I mean, I mean, whatever. Purely sensory, olfactory function. It helps you to smell. Here, this is why you can usually smell fire before you see it because... These nerves right here in this mucosa, here's your olfactory bulb and here's your brain. Like it's, you can normally smell heat. You can smell things before anything else occurs. You'll be in your room and you know that somebody's cooking something good because you can smell it. You don't see them cooking, you don't know, but you can smell it. So these, these are super sensitive, purely sensory. Again, a great amount of information here, if that one is on your review. 
Is smell turned off when you're sleeping? No, because I wake up with smells. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's no motor aspect to it, and there's no parasympathetic innervation. My first answer is I'm really not sure, but my after just thinking about that in my head and saying that out loud, I would say that you're, it is not. It couldn't be, like it can't be taught. I don't. I don't have a true answer because I've never been asked that before. But based on what I, I just wonder because like you know you talk about smelling fire or smelling mm -hmm. smoke or whatever, but would it wake you up? It's more or less what I'm trying to think. Would you know, it wake somebody's you? asleep? Would it wake you? Catches on fire. Gotcha. They die in their bed most of the time. Really? Wow, I didn't think about that. Maybe that's what firefighters think about. <laughs> That's pretty good. Cool. Well, I'm just saying. Yeah. Just wondering. People do fall asleep, uh, to stay asleep? Yeah, they find them, in, they find them in their bed. Or they find them at the front door. One or two. Well, so if they're at the front door, they smelt it. Yeah. Or felt it. Or felt well, it. I'm just saying, whatever. <laughs> you, yeah, you guys, um, you guys got me. That's, what That's a good question. Smoke detectors on them, they make the loud noise. So that it wakes you up. So that it wakes you up. What an excellent application question. I will definitely be googling that tonight. Does it depend on their how how well, like deep their sleep is? Maybe. I don't think so. <laughs> I said mate, but even if you think about it at the like the level that you am, probably not. But I don't know. Mm. I'm gonna have to look. I don't have a true answer for you, and I'm not gonna feed you some line of crap like I know what I'm talking about because I will tell you if I don't know something. <laughs> That's a really good question. Okay, what about the optic nerve? Yeah, I, I think it's going to help you see. I think it's going to help you see. Okay, and um, so that's what the optic nerve does. It references here the optic chiasma. Chiasma just means a crossing point. And technically, when your optic nerve, let me show you instead of trying to move. So you can see that there is an aspect that crosses where those nerves cross. So that's what it's referencing. This part right here is called the optic chiasma. Okay, but you can see also that this eye sends information to its lobe, its, its um, ipsilateral lobe, and contralateral. So the same side and the opposite side. So it's not that it's just doing one or the other. It's communicating to the visual cortex and the association cortex to try to figure out if you recognize what you see. Oculomotor, you guys have already answered this one. But oculomotor is the nerve that's going to control the movement of the eye. Yes. Okay. You also see here that it mentions the raising of the eyelid, directing the eyeball, constricting the iris. So these are all things that not just the eyeball, but areas around it as well. Here, this one nerve will branch, and we'll continue to see this. They get a little bit more complex with each one as we go, but it branches to control a lot of different things. So oculomotor, moving the eye. Trochlear nerve. This one kind of tricky, because when we said trochlea before, it was in the, the forearm, okay? Well, actually, it was at the bottom of the humerus when we were talking about the articulation of the forearm. Trochlear, in this aspect, is talking about a little notch where one of your eye muscles goes through and attaches to the eyeball. So this is helping to move the eyeball. Let me show you where the trochlea is. It's just this little loop right here. So the trochlear nerve is responsible for moving that muscle, and it will pull this tendon which will move that eye. Okay, so it helps with the movement of that eye. So trochlear, if, if I didn't know better, I would say the arm. Like I would think of it as something that would be in the limb. And um, here it's specifically, of course, the face. Trigeminal nerve. The tri part tells you what? There's three parts to it. So this is a nerve that starts as one, and then of course, it, like I mentioned, it's going to continue to branch. This is going to control various areas of your face. So we divide your face into four, or three, I said, three divisions. So you have uh, division one, division two, division three. Here's kind of a heat map to show you division one, division two, division three. Your main nerve, we have ganglia here, a bunch of cell bodies, and then we have the actual nerves, the axons, stretching to the individual parts that they innervate. And the term innervate, I don't know if I've said this yet, but innervate means a nerve touches it. Articulate is where two bones touch. Innervate is when a nerve touches it. So it innervates the skin. It innervates a muscle. It innervates a gland. That's innervation. Abducens nerve. 
So you and I said, like, abduction, abduct, it takes it away. This is what causes your eyes to move laterally, okay, to abduct. So that would be moving away. It mentions, um, on that previous slide, it says that it innervates the lateral rectus muscle. So this is the mu muscle on the outside of the eye, lateral rectus. And rectus tells you that, do you remember what rectus means? Straight, yeah, straight organization of the fibers. Facial nerve. This is the nerve that controls your facial expressions. It innervates the skin. So, all your faces. You start for a one nerve and it branches. This is not innervating individual muscles, it's innervating the skin. So, it's controlling the skin and how your face looks as a result to whatever's going on. Okay? Vestibular cochlear, you guys already said this one. Here, and this is shown in a colored region, like as if there's an implant there. But this is technically super small. Okay, this whole area is super small. This is not to scale. Your ear is not this large. And it's grown into your bone. Like this isn't something you can just take out. But this part right here is the cochlea. This is what you used to hear. This part right here are your sem is your semicircular canals, and you have three, and they run in the three planes that we discussed in chapter one. The frontal plane, transverse plane, and the sagittal plane. So like that, and they're full of fluid. This tells you where you are balance-wise. This area right before it is called the vestibule. That's where the sensors are that tell you, hey, you're leaning this way, you're going this way, you're accelerating, you've stopped. So this nerve right here, we used to call it the auditory nerve. Then we realized that it doesn't just control sound, it also, or not control, but it also receives information on balance. So the name changed from the auditory nerve to the vestibulocochlear nerve. This is receiving information on balance, this is receiving information on sound. So vestibular cochlear. Okay, glossopharyngeal. You and I have already discussed what this means. But it mentions here that it has both sensory and motor functions. Glossopharyngeal. When we talk about the sensory part of it, we have chemoreceptors, which are responding to what? Chemicals. And baroreceptors, which respond to pressure. Okay, pressure. And the motor functions are allowing you to chew, to swallow, to do all of that stuff. Okay, so glossopharyngeal, you have one nerve, branching, we have it, the tongue, and then we have it here, the pharynx. The pharynx is a, an organ or a structure that serves both the respiratory and the digestive system. So at this point, if you were swallowing food, it would be closing your trachea so you didn't choke on it. That would be the goal. If that structure the epiglottis. The vagus nerve. Again, we have both sensory and motor functions here. This nerve controls so much. And when you hear this, a lot of times people are talking about its reference to migraine headaches. They, when they have migraines, they talk about having to throw up or feeling nauseated. And this is why. It's this nerve. And whenever migraines do get really severe, when they talk about doing injections or trying to numb areas, a lot of times it's this nerve that they're trying to calm. And if you do get migraines and throw up, this nerve is calmed. So a lot of times it makes that migraine slowly start to go away. But look at this nerve. Vagus nerve coming from the medulla oblongata, okay, which controls the respiratory and cardiac centers. And look at what it innervates. All of this. That's a lot of innervation receiving a lot of sensory information. So the vagus nerve, of course, is not one that you want to damage because you would lose a lot of sensory information. But because it controls so much, it's, or well, it receives information and controls so much, it would be one of those things that would be difficult to diagnose a problem. So again, it might not be, if it's migraines, it might not be the vagus nerve, but a lot of times it can be tracked back to the vagus nerve. So vagus nerve here, um, and all of its innervation, both sensory and motor. Accessory nerves, these are the last of the cranial nerves. 
or we're getting close, I mean, to the last of the cranial nerves. Um, they just uh, innervate muscles. So you have your accessory nerves down here, and they're just uh, innervating these muscle groups up here in the, the back and around your sternocleidomastoid and all of that. Hypoglossal. Hypoglossal. Below the tongue. That's what it is. Here we are below the tongue. Okay. So again, helping with uh, oops, movement and also forming words for speech. Uh, your glands beneath them, the tonsils and the salivary glands. Cranial nerves. Here, this is using the same, we just discussed all of them, another learning device, a mnemonic tool to know whether each of the cranial nerves is either sensory, motor, or both. You just need to know the composition of the nerves that are listed on the review. Okay. Now, if you're trying to holistically learn all of this, then of course you want to know, oh, the optic nerve is only sensory. Olfactory is only sensory. Vagus is sensory and motor, so both. That would be something. But that's what this mnemonic device is doing. Spinal nerves. <clears throat> On the spinal nerves, they pretty much correlate with the number of vertebrae in each of your, uh, in your vertebral column, except for the cervical, because we have seven cervical vertebrae, but we have eight cervical nerves. And it's because all of the nerves, so here's the vertebrae, all of the nerves go below them. So the C1, C, it would be below it, except for the cervical, it has one on top. So it has C1 up here, then C2, C3, C4. So everywhere other than that, it's following below that. The nerve goes below it. So in the cervical area at the very top, we have one on top of that and one below it. But 31 pair of nerves, um, again, right and left, and they correspond with the, the parts of the uh, vertebral column. When we talk about the, this is telling you why you have eight. When we talk about the spinal nerves, it'll start in that area below that vertebrae, and then we'll have this large area, and then as it gets more distal, it starts to branch off. So we'll start with this thick cord, and it'll begin to kind of branch off, and it'll discuss that in just a bit. But the way that we're studying these is by their plexus. Now, plexus is a fancy word for a group of. So the cervical plexus is a group of cervical nerves, nerves in the cervical area. Brachial plexus, this is a group of nerves that serves my arm. Cervical enlargement is not a plexus. What is another one? Lumbar plexus, a group of nerves in the lumbar area. Okay, sacral plexus, and so on. You're already familiar with cauda equina. <clears throat> cervical enlargement and lumbar enlargement. Let me reference those because you'll be asked about them later. This is where in the spinal cord it kind of enlarges because there's a whole bunch of cell bodies so this is where the main core for the lower limbs is, main core root place for the upper limbs. So the cervical enlargement is going to go to the arms, the lumbar enlargement is going to lead to the legs. So that's why there's that little swelling there. Um, I don't see any ganglia depicted here, so I'm not going to point those out, but just kind of give you an idea. If it's a ventral nerve, tell me what it's going to do. Motor. That's what this slide is telling you, and it's going to say this. It's going to continue to say that. Hey, don't forget this is motor. Dorsal, sensory. Okay, so it is written in a lot of different words. I get it, but that's ultimately what it is saying here. Okay, here. A couple of things I want to point out. When we talk about the term mixed nerve, right here, this part is motor, so it's going to go efferent. This part right here is sensory. But as we continue to move, they're wrapped together. So we now call it a mixed nerve. So the sensory information will travel up this, and then it will separate. And it will go back dorsal, inter and to be integrated there, and then it will send a motor response back out that nerve. So when we say mixed nerve, that's what we're referencing. If it's sensory, it only has dorsal connections. And if it's only motor, which, whatever, that's not a thing, but it would only have ventral on that. Okay, here it's showing you different ganglia, so a bunch of cell bodies together. We call this the sympathetic trunk, ganglial trunk, because when we talk about the sympathetic nervous system, everything that we do will come through one of these ganglia. That's what that's showing us. Okay. 
All right. When the term rami, first of all, anything, when we're talking about nerves, if it's dorsal, it's sensory. If it's ventral, it's motor. That's non-negotiable. So when it's talking about rami, all these are are small little nerves. Okay, not full nerves that travel a long distance. They're just small little nerves. So like right here, we have some rami. We have a little bit of rami here. Not full nerves that control and do a whole lot of things. We just have small little rami. And that's what they're referencing. If it's a ventral rami, it's doing motor. If it's a dorsal rami, it's giving sensory information. Okay, so just small little nerve extensions. Now what we're going to do is go into each plexus and... We're not going to study every single nerve, but we'll talk about main nerves that are found in those plexi. Okay? So the cervical plexus, we have cutaneous nerves. What are they going to do? Cutaneous nerves. Skin, something with the skin. Okay? The phrenic nerve, the phrenic nerve is the nerve that travels down to your diaphragm and controls your diaphragm. When that nerve, and these are all in the cervical plexus, so they're all up here, when the phrenic nerve is irritated, you get hiccups. So that's the nerve that causes you to get hiccups. And that's when people are like, oh, if you drink water, you close your breath, you do any of that stuff. Because the, all of that is functioning in this area. Drink water upside down, whatever it is that you do to get rid of hiccups. But, take your breath away. Huh? Oh, just take your breath away? Like the phrenic nerve? The, whenever, you, whenever you hit yourself. And you that's hit. because literally the air's been knocked out. Like the, it's, it's not the full lung collapse, but the pressure of inside, what we call the interpleural pressure, is much greater than the atmospheric pressure, so it pushes everything out. And so it literally takes your breath, like the, the air is gone, so you're kind of gasping for that. The diaphragm, hopefully the diaphragm wouldn't be damaged anymore, but I'm not saying that it couldn't be. Um, so phrenic nerve is your hiccup nerve. Cutaneous is controlling the skin in this area. Okay, so cervical plexus. Here again, we're up close. You can see we have some thickness here, and then it kind of gets smaller as we continue to, to go distally. Okay, so uh, cutaneous or uh, cervical plexus. It tells you here each of the branches which rami, if it has a rami associated with it, and what it specifically serves, if that nerve is there. And I didn't do any rami for you because that would just be torture. But we did talk about specific nerves. This slide right here, it, I want to, of course, it should go first, but it shows you how that whenever they're at the spinal cord, they start off as roots, then they become trunks, then they become divisions, then they become cords. You don't have to know that, but this is just showing you that it goes, starts off as a root, then as a trunk, then they divide, then we go into individual cords. So all this is doing is reiterating the fact that we start off really thick here, and then we continue to get smaller as we move more distally. So proximal, it's really thick. Distal, it's much smaller. Well, a little bit smaller. This is just referencing the uh, brachial plexus. I wouldn't study this if I were you. I just can't take it out because I don't make these notes. I get it how it flows, but if you don't study it for a while, it becomes very confusing. So I would skip that if I were you. Some important nerves that we find in our brachial plexus. So brachial plexus is below the cervical plexus. Plexus. We have the axillary nerve. Where do you think that may be? Axillary nerve. So the axillary area would be like your armpit-ish area, and we're in the brachial plexus. Musculocutaneous. Muscle and skin. Okay, just putting these terms together and you can start to figure out what they do. Median gives you a position. It's in the middle. What about the ulnar nerve? The ulna, radial. Okay, so here you have that. And you can see how the divisions and they get smaller as you move more distally on a cadaver. There's a good, good looking dissection right there. You can get those nerves like that. Okay, lumbar plexus. So we didn't talk about a thoracic plexus. Most of the muscles in the uh, thoracic area are going to be controlled by rami. So um, those are just smaller ones. So we went from the brachial, we're going all the way to lumbar. What about the femoral nerve? That, yeah, that's, yeah. Hopefully we know that that's going to be the thigh. 
If you don't know that, that's, it's not okay. <laughs> I was gonna say, that's okay, because no, it's, you should know that. The obturator, this is what's gonna help to innervate the adductor of your thighs. What is an adducting motion? Move it towards that midline, yeah, adducting. Okay, so you can see that here, femoral and then obturator right there. Look at how thick that femoral nerve is. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Okay. Uh, sacral plexus, we have the sciatic nerve. A sciatic nerve is the most popular nerve when people are talking about back pain and all of that and their legs hurting and shooting pains. The sciatic nerve actually starts off as one, and we find it running through the hamstring, adductor muscles, and most of the muscles of your lower limb. So when you have sciatic pain, you can, you're just like, my leg hurts. And then the doctor says, well, I think you have a pinched nerve, and it turns out that it's a sciatic nerve. So that's not an uncommon problem. The cool thing about the sciatic nerve is then, once it gets a little bit more distal, so it continues to travel down, it separates into the fibular and tibial nerves. So it separates to become smaller, but it still controls that. So um, no wonder that you can feel so much pain whenever that sciatic nerve is damaged. So here you can kind of see where this is not showing the tibial and tibial, and this is, that would be lower. But here you can see it's showing it as two right here, how that sciatic nerve grouped together, and then it will separate to become the tibial and fibular nerve. And you can see how that separates as you go down. So look how thick that nerve is. It's a pretty thick, big, thick nerve. Okay, again, look in here. Clearly you can pull the sciatic out of that. I mean, it's super thick and obvious. <clears throat> Anterolateral thorax. In the, in the front and sides. Look at what it says here, rami. So these are not controlled by these big cords. These are small little nerve that are, that are taking care of that. Of course, you're going to see dorsal and ventral because they're sensory and motor. Yes. Your dermatome. A dermatome is another map, and this is why whenever patients are, um, experience some type of trauma, and they're like, I can't feel my foot, the doctor will say, can you feel this? Can you feel this? Can you feel this? And this is the map that they follow. So we've looked at a few maps. Um, this kind of looks like the cleavage map that we looked, by, looked at in the integumentary system. But like whenever you stroke the patient here, if the patient can feel that, then that means that the nerve associated with the fifth lumbar is intact. But if the patient can't feel that, then we know that there could potentially be damage to that. Okay? So um, when you're like, oh, this hurts, and they're trying to figure out if it's nerve damage or something, that's when they use the dermatome. These areas are controlled by those nerves, and we can tell if there's damage, if you can respond or not, when those nerves are excited. So here's a dermatome map for that, and how you assess, assess uh, nerve damage. Peripheral motor endings. This is where it talks about the neurotransmitters that could potentially be released. And it'll talk about our neuromuscular junction. And neuromuscular junction, what's going to be released? What neurotransmitter? Acetylcholine, yes. Okay, so it goes through and it talks about that. And that lease of release of acetylcholine will then create an action potential or a muscle contraction. So exact same diagram from chapter 9. Okay, what if you don't have a neuromuscular junction? What if we're talking about viscera or smooth muscle? Then it has that Christmas light formation that I talked about, those net Christmas lights, which we call the variscosities. Okay, so not individual nerve to muscle fiber, but we have like a group that it serves. So a variscosity. Okay, we see that in smooth muscle, so we call that smooth muscle innervation. Reflexes. Reflexes usually reference, um, I mean it could be like you throwing up or something like that, but when we're talking about reflexes, it's like your ability to react, but it's skeletal muscles that are doing that. Anytime that a reflex, um, a skeletal muscle, and you're doing something that you can physically move, it doesn't require brain integration. It's only your spinal cord. So we're going to talk about different types of reflexes. Um, the, there is a difference between learned reflexes versus the ones that you were born with. So learned reflex would be something that you were taught. Okay, If you were born with it, then you weren't taught it. 
Okay, you just learn it. And it follows this reflex arc, which you and I have already talked about. So I'm going to go back to this slide right quick. But it starts with your receptor, a sensory neuron that comes in dorsally. It's integrated. The motor neuron transmits that information ventrally to an effector. An effector is anything that is going to actually react as a response to that motor nerve. So an effector could be a muscle, it could be a gland, it could be another nerve. It could be a muscle, a gland, or another nerve. So in this case, the effector is a muscle because we're going to be talking about uh, reflexes, but here it's showing you, okay, you stepped on a nail or got poked with a needle. That receptor sends information of the sensory neuron dorsally. It's integrated. Motor neuron says to an effector, hey, I need you to contract or I need you to, to do something as a result of that. <clears throat> Two classifications of reflexes, somatic and autonomic. Guess what the difference is? Good. Okay, spinal reflexes, these are normally the ones that are somatic. Okay, why do we test your reflexes? To make sure that everything's working the way that it should be. If for whatever reason you don't respond when we test your reflex, like there's a couple of reasons for that. Like when they do the patellar knee uh, jerk, like with the hammer. Some, you, a lot of times you can override that. Like you can tell your brain, don't move, don't move. And so, you know, some kids do that, some adults do that, so that the doctor thinks something's wrong. But just because the majority of patients are supposed to respond one way doesn't mean that everybody will. But why do we test your reflexes? To make sure that you're maintaining homeostasis and that there's no damage. So if your reflex is non-existent or extremely exaggerated, that could be a problem. Okay? So, um... The stretch and tendon reflexes. These two are opposite of each other, but we're going to use the same example. Okay? So, just generally speaking, the stretch reflex is when your muscle is stretched, it sends a message that says, hey, I'm stretched. So, what does it immediately want to do? The muscle itself wants to contract. Okay? So, a stretch reflex is whenever that muscle is stretched, it naturally wants to immediately begin to contract in order to prevent damage. The tendon reflex is where that tendon is stretched and the antagonistic muscle will flex in order to get it back to rest. So we're, and I'm going to show you diagrams, but we're talking about the same type of movement, but on the, well, it's the two different movements, but we're doing the same thing. We're trying to prevent damage of tissue. Okay, specifically here, muscles what, and tendons. Is recoil a part of that, or is that just... A re yes. So whenever we talk about the stretch reflex, we're looking at the muscle and the muscle wanting to come back. The, like, naturally, we don't want it to stretch too far. I don't Like, some of you stretch in the morning, and you stretch, and then it feels really good at first, and then there's a time when it starts to feel uncomfortable. And then you kind of do this number. And that's a natural response to when those muscles are stretched. And they're wanting to go back and contract. So that would be your recoil mechanism. Okay. Um, here it's just telling you that the stretch reflex helps us to maintain our posture. So a lot of times, you know, we'll be sitting here for a little while, and then we'll stretch. It'll feel good. And then we'll get lazy again. And it's just, it's just part of what we do. Okay. It adjusts reflexively. We're looking for positive responses. Again, if there's hypoactive, which means it's low it doesn't react the way it's supposed to, or it's absent, we think that there may, be something, there may be something wrong. What this is showing you, and if you follow these diagrams, they help. And I'm not sure if this is on your review or not, but let me just show you how to read this diagram. So, again, blue is sensory, the red is motor. If it's showing positive, that means it's getting information to that. If it's showing negative, it's, so it's sending action potentials. If it's showing negative, it's inhibitory. So it's not doing anything. So here, this muscle right here is being stretched. Okay? So it's sending that information to the spinal cord saying, hey, I'm being stretched. It is right here telling the muscle itself to contract. And the antagonistic muscle, it's telling it to not do anything. Okay? So this is the muscle itself responding to being stretched on its own. And I, I do think that if you try to study this on your own without reading the diagrams, it can become confusing. So I want to make sure you know how to read those diagrams. OK? 
Okay, so it's showing you here the patellar knee jerk. So the quadricep muscle, whenever you get hit with that hammer, this muscle stretches because that tendon is pushed in, so it stretches that muscle. So immediately this muscle wants to contract and your knee, your leg should kind of fling up as a result of that. Okay, so again, you can see it's a positive sending a sensory information. It's telling the nerve that's controlling the quadriceps to contract. The one that's controlling the hamstring, it's saying don't do anything. It's inhibiting that right now. So that's a stretch reflex. The tendon reflex, this is where it's going to activate the antagonistic muscle. Okay, this is where it's going to activate the antagonistic muscle. So it's trying to get it to do the reciprocal activation. So let me show you what we're looking at. So we have whatever it is sensory-wise. It's being sent. It says, hey, this is what's happening here. It's telling the muscle itself not to do anything. You can see that with the negative. But the antagonistic muscle it's telling to contract to bring it back to its resting position. Okay? This is how our antagonistic, our muscles work together anyway. But one... One we call the stretch reflex. The stretch reflex is the muscle itself responding, and the uh, tendon reflex is the antagonistic muscle responding. A flexor withdrawal reflex, and this is just fun to act out, but like whenever you, are, you step on glass, what's the very first thing you do? You lift that leg up that you just hurt, okay? And the other one extends out. So we call this the extensor or withdrawal reflex because this one is withdrawn and this one extends, okay? That, or that's showing the flexor because this one here and then we'll have the withdrawal, which is the other one going back. This is protective. Another example is when someone tries to grab your hands. So if you step on the glass, you're immediately going to bring that up, so you're flexing that, okay, a withdrawal reflex. The cross extensor is where you immediately extend that. So I did, when I was giving my explanation, I was doing both of these at the same time. So the flexor is just bringing it up. The extensor is you trying to protect it. Cross extensor reflex, when someone tries to grab your hand, what do you do? If you weren't ready for it. You immediately pull it, and then you swing. It's, <laughs> it's your natural response. It's your natural response. Even when it's your kids, you're like, like, you pull and swing, okay? But it's, it, the way this is explaining it is that you pull and you swing with the other arm. Just like if you step on glass, you pull and then you stand on the other one, okay? It's just your way of protecting yourself, and it's going to show you here. Somebody tries to grab your hand. Okay, stop. Okay, this is clearly a karate hit, the way his hand is, or hers. But that's what we're talking about there. These are just natural reflexes to your body trying to prevent any type of harm. Superficial reflexes. The plantar, plantar and the abdominal reflex. When somebody rubs their finger across the bottom of your foot, what should your foot do? It should point down. It should do that. Okay? When if, if they did that and you go, ha ha, that tells us that something's wrong. Okay. <laughs> um, they do this with babies. To, to check and see that they're um, neurolated correctly, that innervation is working. So we don't expect for babies to have complete control, so we expect there to be some type of fanning of their toes because they're newborn. But as they continue to age and gain control, we should see that. The abdominal reflex is the same thing. The doctor will have you lie down, and then they'll kind of just stroke your abdomen, and your natural reflex is to flex. That's what we expect to see. So that's what it's going to reference here. Uh, the plantar reflex, we're looking for those toes to kind of go down in the event that there's some type of damage. It's what we call Babinski sign. That's kind of going like this. We expect to see this in small children, okay, but not in older children or adults. The abdominal reflex, that's where you're supposed to flex. If you don't flex, then we think that some, that could indicate something that's wrong. It doesn't mean it is. These are just one of many ways that we can assess that. And your response may be really exaggerated, or it might be really subtle. Like it might just be a small flex, and some people might be like, stop getting working. Like it just depends on that patient and their pain tolerance. Developmental aspects of the peripheral nervous system. Just like we talked about previously, you go from here down. So you will begin to gain control 
on these muscles first, and as you continue to age, it will continue to spread. So it mentions that here, that this forms from your ectoderm, and that it was mentioned, and that's because that is the third layer of your triploblast, because you're a triploblast. We have different segments, and we're not going to compare it to other animals because this is human anatomy, but our segments are divided up and controlled, and those are based on how we develop. Peripheral nerves are viable throughout life unless they're subjected to trauma. So if something happens, then something, there could be damage, but otherwise they should be good for life. Okay, let's take a break.